Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Today we thought we would explore a little bit of history that we would find pretty amazing, at least for many of us who have heard the story. That's right, there are some fascinating stories within human history that deserve to be explored and mostly remembered, and many of them etched into our minds. Most recently, one of the greatest steamships ever built, passenger liners that many people are familiar with, is the RMS Titanic. That's right, this was something that was built to be a modern marvel of engineering of the sites that nobody had ever seen before. She carried 2,224 passengers and crew on her maiden voyage, and on the night of the 14th of April in 1912, at approximately 10 minutes before midnight, struck an iceberg, and within 17 minutes had sank. 1,502 people had died in one of the deadliest sea things that had ever occurred in the history of mankind as it lays two miles deep in the bottom depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Certainly etched in minds and imaginations around the world would be considered to be one of the most incredible stories, at least ship stories, ever told. But it's only rivaled by one, and that one particular ship can be found in the pages of the Bible and the story of Genesis. That's right, Noah with his hands and people built together one of the largest, if not the largest, ships ever known. According to some reports, this ship would be more than three football fields long and more than two football fields wide, housing pairs of animals and humans in one of the greatest floods known in mankind's history. But the question about Noah's Ark simply isn't, did it exist, but where is it today? We do know where the Titanic is, but yet Noah's Ark has yet to be found. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is author of the book, The Unsolved Mystery of Noah's Ark. And our guest today has spent, along with her late husband, more than a quarter of a century trying to answer this particular question. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Miss Mary Irwin. Mary, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Well, thank you, Daniel. It's a privilege and a delight. You know, this is one of those stories. You know, again, the Titanic, almost everybody alive today knows about this. You know, and this is something recent. Noah's Ark really isn't that old in the scheme of things, and yet here was a ship that literally could have almost housed the Titanic, and we can't seem to figure out where it is. Why is that? Well, first of all, I have a hard time, very difficult, wrapping my brain around how big it was. Right. I, really, if you ever just walking on a length of one football field, but three, right, it's, it's tough. But why uh, haven't we really been able to uh, nail down where this ark landed? Well, I think that's a real good question, and uh, people have men have searched for the ark for really hundreds of years. And we go back to ancient historians like Herodotus and Josephus who wrote about it. Even Marco Polo uh, was talking about it, but he never saw anything either. They only um, quoted from one another's writings. They just really didn't see it. Now, what really, I guess, aided you to decide to spend, again, more than 25 years, you know, looking into the evidence about Noah's Ark, if, in fact, it existed, and where is it? How do we find it? I didn't have a difficult time believing God's Word that it did exist. But what I was trying to sort out were all the stories I was uh, had read about. Now, this elderly gentleman... Uh, who since passed away, Earl Cummings, had come to my uh, my home seeking my husband Jim's help in trying to get back on the mountain, Mount Ararat in Turkey, to look for the ark. He had been there, I don't know how many times, maybe 10, 15 times over there, searching, searching, searching. And suddenly the um, Turkish government closed the uh, Mount Ararat to all climbing uh, permits. They just it just wasn't going to happen. So Mr. Cummings came to my home to ask Jim if uh, his fame from being an astronaut. Did he think that maybe uh, they would open the mountain for him and some climbers? Well, 
that's what happened. Jim did write a letter to, um, I think, General Tormte, and uh, it just went on up into the command, and he was allowed to bring men in. So there were 12 of them that went that one year. <clears throat> but before Mr. Cummings left our home, he left a book with us that his wife, Violet, had just, it was just hauled off the press, called Has Anyone Really Seen Noah's Ark? And so I grabbed that book right away and just began to be absorbed in it. And the way my mind works, sort of like a detective, uh, I was writing in the book and writing on paper, okay, this person said this, this one said this. Well, now this doesn't agree with that. So it was difficult for me to try to sort out who saw what and whether they were telling the truth or not, or whether they were just... um, fantasizing whether they did see something, I didn't know. But later I found that since Mount Ararat is a volcanic mountain, there are many fracture patterns in uh, in the rock. And uh, it, it is so, so cut, so clearly cut whenever those fracture patterns occur that it is it's very regular it, and it's very deceiving. At a long, long distance, it does look like there is something there on the side of the mountain, and that's why men keep trucking over there. Mm-hmm. Now, first of all, let's talk about Ararat, because this is where it is alleged that Noah's Ark ended up. Okay, But, but obviously, as you, you talk about in the book a little further, and you actually quote from the Bible what it says, Well, maybe that's not the case, but I'd like to talk about, first of all, (laughs) Mount Ararat, first of all, before we get into all that. Now, describe describe this mountain for our listeners out there who probably mostly have heard the name but really aren't familiar with what it is. Well, in uh, eastern Turkey, it's very, very close, probably mm, 10, 10 miles from the Russian border, and uh, there is greater Ararat, and next to it is lesser Ararat. Now, really, nothing really grows uh, at all on lesser Ararat. It is just full of what is known as scree. Scree is like fine gravel, and so people don't, they're not on that mountain. Mm-hmm. A few people live at the foot of, the, uh, of Mount Ararat, the greater one, because this is where they have their cro- um, their sheep, their flocks, all, all summer long. And this is, this is their way of life. Well, the scripture tells us it is in the, that the ark landed in the mountains of Ararat. However, people keep saying it's Mount Ararat that it landed on, but that is not what scripture said. So they keep going back, and there are men that are going back every year, like Dick Bright, he's been over there, Oh, I'm thinking at least 20 times he spent a fortune going over there. And if you talk to him today, he is convinced it's there, and he's going back again. Mm-hmm. I know that uh, there's a part in your book that you talk about, or you actually share the idea of tradition as you describe the fiddler on the roof. And it's interesting how we have all traditions, and pretty soon it gets to a point we just don't tend to question the information itself. We just tend to believe it, you know, sort of the foundation of belief, uh, you know, even the evolution of myth itself. And I had some funny experience with how quickly this can actually happen. Uh, as anyone who's ever been up to the Northwest, uh, there is an area in Washington, uh, which is the Mount Adams National Park. Mm-hmm. Now, in that area, there is a man with a farm, and it is considered to be one of the premier sites for people who are interested in gazing and searching for the extraterrestrial, the UFOs. Apparently this uh, Mount Adams was a place where one of the first believed UFO sightings had ever occurred. And so this guy has a farm. It's been featured on radio shows countlessly uh, throughout the years. But you can go out to this man's farm, and sure enough, on the gate... You know, it's featured on coast-to-coast radio. This is the UFO place. You can come out there at night and look for UFOs. He's got a great view of Mount Adams off in the distance. And if you don't see any UFOs, what you will experience 
is, you know, celestial views that are just breathtaking, to say the least. But what was interesting is the night that we happened to be out there, there seemed to be a helicopter that decided to go out to this area and was hovering in a particular area, and pretty soon before you know it, the owner of the farm is saying, well, that seems awfully unusual, you know, to see something like this. And the man's been there for quite a long time <clears throat> and describes how there might be some climbers that are stuck up uh, there and so forth and how you need permits even to fly a helicopter. This was at about 11 o'clock at night. And so he started this, but slowly what you started hearing other people do is pick up a piece of this story and revalidate it and revalidate it. Pretty soon they were becoming experts about this one little incident. <laughs> and I found that really funny because you can see the same thing in something like this, but this is powerful and has a lot of history behind it. You are right, Daniel. And in, interesting in Scripture, in Mark 7, um, chapter 7, verse 13, it ab- actually speaks to what you just said, is that making the Word of God of none effect through your Traditions. So it's traditions, traditions, and it makes God's word of none effect. Because God's word, I think it's chapter 10 in Genesis, that it says as they journeyed from the east, after they were out of the ark and uh, things began to liven up and move again when God told them to, to move and replenish the earth, it says as they, as they journeyed from the east, they came to plains of Shinar. Well, the plains of Shinar are in Babylon or modern-day Iraq. Mm -hmm. So if they came from the east, that means that they were in Persia or modern-day Iran. It did not say in Scripture as they journeyed from the north. The north would be where Mount Ararat is located. As they journeyed from the north, they came to the plains of Shinar. And I did ask this one a gentleman that uh, is a wonderful artist, and he was sitting and talking to some of the men who had said, two of the men who had said that, that they had seen Noah's Ark, and these were probably 80 years apart or so. And uh, I asked him, I said, why, Alfred, are, are you insisting that it is on Mount Ararat when the Bible says as they journeyed from the east? Now, this man is a Christian, and his parents were uh, missionaries. And yet, he's still stuck on Mount Ararat. He said, well, maybe it landed on Ararat first, and then they went to uh, Persia, and then to uh, the plains of Shinar. And I'm holding my head thinking, now, wait a minute. If that was so, God's word would have said so. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are so afraid because they have so much invested, so much pride and so much money invested in Mount Ararat being the mountain that it's very difficult to have these men back down and say, you know, maybe I better take another look at this. Maybe there is another possibility. Mm-hmm. Now, first, let's go ahead and explore Noah's Ark itself. Uh, we're touching a little bit about where we think it might be or why it mm-hmm. isn't where a lot of people believe it is. But first of all, talk about you know how it was constructed according to uh, the Bible, the size of this, and what it was really for. Well, it, it was for just exactly what was placed in there. Mm-hmm. Noah had preached for a hundred years for the people to get their heart right with God. And God had spoken to, uh, to Noah and told him, you build an ark. Well, what's an ark? I had someone on uh, a radio interview the other day that said, why are they always making Noah's Ark look like a Spanish galleon? And I said, well, because they they didn't go to the source, of the, which is the scriptures, or go to Strong's Concordance and find out what the word Ark means. Ark is a box, it's a rectangular, just like the Ark of the Covenant was rectangular. And so... God told them to build this ark, build it out of gopher wood. Well, we have scratched our heads and dug and dug and tried to locate what is gopher wood. What was gopher wood then 
probably is what is known as cypress today because cypress trees grew very, very tall. And I did some research on that and put that in the book too. And because of uh, the, uh, the cypress is a very hard wood, and then they pitched. God told them to pitch it on the outside and the inside to make it waterproof. And then at the point at the point of time when it was time to get Noah and his family into this ark of safety, God began to supernaturally bring in the animals two by two. And of those who were clean, that were a little more, had to have sacrifices afterward, there were more. Now, but does it state what type of animals, or was it just everything that was pretty much in the local area? You know, I don't think we know that, Daniel. Okay. Uh, I, I really I really don't think that we know that, not that I have observed. Right. And they could have been very small animals, male and female. Mm-hmm. I, because you always love how it's depicted. You see a pair of giraffes, a pair of lions, a pair of yeah. hippopotamus. They yeah. Go, yeah, how are these creatures ever going to live together for 40 days and 40 nights without getting after each other, you know? And well, it was much less the cleaning that's got to be involved in something like that. <laughs> it was longer than that, Daniel. They were in shut up in the ark for a year. A year, okay. Yeah, that that well, you're just talking about the some of the rain, mm-hmm. but. No, they were in there for a year before they all were let out and the land was dry. Well, realizing that there was, this ark was probably three stories, that in the probably in the lower part was the uh, was the zoo, so to speak, and um, anything that was below like that in the dark, I think that it's very possible many of those animals were in a hibernation state. Mm. Fascinating. Now, what I really liked were some of the stories that you brought up about people who had claimed to have actually seen the ark. Mm -hmm. And again, we're back to stories again, but no real physical evidence, so to speak. Uh, But there was a piece of wood from one. Tell us about that. Oh, yes, that was... That was a story of Ferdinand Navarro, the Frenchman. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, he had invited my husband and me over to uh, to his place in Bordeaux, France, yeah, many years ago. And uh, he asked Jim, when while we were in his home, would you like to have a piece of the wood I brought back, that uh, part of Noah's Ark? And Jim, of course, was delighted. So he went whatever his little hiding place was and sawed off a piece of wood and brought it to my husband and. Then Jim brought it home and sent it off to uh, a company and organization that does this type of scientific uh, analysis. And uh, it wasn't what this man stated it to be. They were able to determine that it was a a white oak. And one thing that puzzled uh, the scientists looking at this is how in the world, did they get a petroleum-based substance into this wood without high pressurization, which they didn't have 5,000 years ago? And so there there were some questions which made Navarro look kind of foolish, and yet he swore it was. Well, it wasn't until Mr. Cornuke went over there probably about eight years ago, and he met an old gentleman someone introduced him to, and he said that Navarra had come to him, asked him to to get a piece of very old wood and take it up into this uh, Parrot Glacier and drop it in to this crevasse area. So he was exactly knew where it was going to be. That's why when he, Navarra went over there, with his son, Raphael, uh, they went right to the place and said, oh, we found a piece of Noah's Ark. Well, Mr. Navarra had paid this elderly gentleman a lot of money to put this piece of wood that was 500 years old down under this crevasse. And how interesting is that the, the Parrot Glacier 
which is on the north side of the mountain, Mount Ararat. That glacier was two, about 250 feet thick or maybe a little more. Mm-hmm. And men were saying, well, it's underneath here. We just know it is. And on and on and on they would go and they would take uh, equipment to try to prove it's sonar equipment. And Lord only knows what kind of equipment they took over there. Well, guess what? In all these years ensuing with this global warming, it all melted, Daniel. Mm-hmm. The Parrot Glacier is down, was down to rock. There was nothing there. Never was. And it just kind of leaves you wondering, will it ever be found? (laughs) But now, one of the funniest stories that I found in here, too, and uh, as you alluded to earlier, as Noah was, I guess, channeling the message of God about what to do, is it kind of coincides with the power of prayer and listening for the message. And that was the story of uh, Ron Wyatt, where you did the very same thing, and it had occurred during a sort of a, a, a prayer sermon, whatever the, it may be called, uh, that this guy might have ended up stuck and probably dying in a Saudi prison. <laughs> now let's talk about the character here of Ron Wyatt. Well. I know that he was one of your favorites, according to what you wrote. <laughs> but this was a guy who had claimed, you know, to know where it was, and you know, but never can seem to get there. So <laughs> he had con- tried to convince my husband that God had revealed to him all the secrets of the universe. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sitting in the back seat of the car with this man uh, as we were. He picked us up from the airport in uh, Tennessee because Jim was speaking at his church, I guess, that night. And I said, you know, Ron. You've really asked me to believe a lot of things. It's not that God can't show one man all the secrets of the universe, but I kind of doubt that he did. Right. And, uh, now, what's the use of the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently, I made a mistake in thinking that he was a psychiatric nurse. That is what I was told. But someone has tried to straighten me out and said, no, he was an anesthesiology type of nurse. I thought you were going to say psychiatric patient, but okay. Well, <laughs> I won't go there, but he was one slick operator. And uh, whatever his nursing abilities were, I don't know. And it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me was his character. Mm-hmm. And he would claim all these things. Well, he found a man who was a uh, marine salvage expert and they went over there together to uh, Turkey and this site that's called the Derupener site the reason it's called that is because it was a pilot and that was his last name Derupener he spotted this uh, flow in uh, the side of well the hillside and it's probably 20 20 miles I think south of uh, Mount Ararat (coughs) And Ron Wyatt went to Turkey to convince the Turkish government that this sighting that was shaped like a, well, it looks like an almond, you know, just Mm -hmm. points at both ends. And yet the Bible says it was an ark. It didn't have a prow. It It was rectangular in size. This outflow, this upcropping in in the mud was had uh, points on both ends. Well, that this wasn't a sealing ship. It wasn't going anywhere. It just had to float. Right. Anyway, so uh, this man who was a, a salvage expert, uh, he went with Ron, and they went and gritted out the whole thing, and they did experiments, and he says, there's iron. Well, isn't it interesting to know that... Noah's Ark was built before the Iron Age? Hmm. Now, how could that be? So everything was just falling. But he had managed, Ron White had managed to talk the Turkish government <clears throat> into building a tourist site there, saying this is the remains of Noah's Ark. So it's a moneymaker. It's on the highway, you know. It's just mm-hmm. right off the highway. It's like you would see any little uh, tourist trap 
going down some highway uh, in America. Okay. Now, it's interesting because you really, uh, I guess you approach this subject with skepticism because you would have to just so that you can be sure the evidence that is brought before you seems to just have some legitimacy. And, you know, as a result, you, you have these interesting stories that you brought here in the book together. And the way that you went about corroborating just how much of what they were telling you was true, and in most cases it just had to be, you know, like dealing with location. Well, how could you say that you've seen it here and you were herding sheep, for instance, at the base of Mount Ararat when there's no food or any good drinking water? And then there was the question of being able to, helicopter to a certain level or elevation to be able to take these pictures. I mean, there were a lot of ways that you just kind of went about this to just verify whether what they were saying was true. But there was one particular one, uh, Ed Davis, that you talked about where he seemed to be one of the first, at least from all of the other ones that you were sharing in here, that really checked out. Tell us about that. Yeah, that man was fascinating, and I'm only regret is that I never got to meet this man because I would have validated everything that he said. <clears throat> he was uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, in the Second World War, and they stationed him in uh, Iran. At this point in the Second World War, Russia was our ally, and so we needed to help that war effort because the Germans want to come in and crush Russia and take that too. So we went in to help them along with the Brits. The Brits and the Americans basically were occupying Iran at that time. So we were uh, bringing a, a lot of road work, a lot of supplies up through the, um, the, the Gulf. They were building roads from the Gulf straight up so they could bring shipments in there or uh, by, by boat, or then they were flying in also. But they were building roads from that point right into Russia. And so Ed was uh, with the car, like I said, Corps of Engineers, building roads, and they were building buildings and uh, barracks and what have you. And um, to build roads, you had to use dynamite. And in this dynamite uh, explosion, it shut the waterways off to the Lurdish people. Well, now, if you go back and look at the, um, the map, the, um, there's a mountain range in between uh, Iraq and Iran, and it's called the Zagros Mountains. Well, right on the, um, probably at the edge of the Zagros Mountains, it would be, mm, okay, it would be western Iran, would be right there at the Zagros Mountain area. That's where he was stationed. And in that mountain range were peaceful people. And uh, he called them Lurds. But because he was a Texan and had an accent, the men who were questioning him thought he said Kurds because that is what the people are called that live at the base of Mount Ararat. That used to be Kurdistan. Huh. And so what I was wondering in my head, uh, talking to Bob Cornuk, I says, you know, Bob, he kept uh, calling them the Lurds, because Bob had, was there at that particular meeting, and he heard Ed talking. And Ed had gone through three lie detector tests. He said, and Bob had been a, a policeman a detective, and he said, this man, I don't know where he was, but he was telling the truth. <clears throat> so when, when I got to talking to Bob about the Lurds, I said, you know what, let me check this out because I got a funny feeling that the Lurds, just what he says that they are, they're not Kurds. So I got out my 100-year-old map, and there it was. The mountain range, there the, uh, uh, the Zagros Mountain in between Iraq and Iran was called... Luristan. They were the Lurds. Ed was right. Hmm. But what had happened was that the, the waterway had to their farms, to their crops, to the animals, to their homes had been blocked and there was no water coming through. So when his 
Ed's driver, who was alert, told him about the situation uh, undercover, and he did not want it known until he was dead. He was afraid still that the Army would put him in <laughs> in the brig, poor man. <laughs> <laughs> but he had given um, the body some uh, sticks of dynamite to reopen the waterway. Now, these people were so grateful. The only th- They're poor people, for goodness sakes, in a third world country. They had nothing to give him. They were just grateful. Mm-hmm. And so they asked him, would you like to see Noah's Ark? Well, of course he wanted to see Noah's Ark. You see, all the other men are looking for it. This man was taken to it. But what really unlocked this whole thing for me was when, and I only saw it written or spoke about in one place, and that was in a, a book written by Don Shockey, <clears throat> this man from New Mexico where Ed Davis lived. And uh, he talked about when they were on whatever mountain they were on, the, the men in, uh, interviewing Mr. Davis kept saying, uh, Mount Ararat, Mount Ararat. Well, the Bible says Mount Ararat. So it was so stuck in his head. The man thought it was on Mount Ararat, but he didn't know what the mountain was called that he was taken to. Mm -hmm. But what he did say after, because it was so, uh, the weather was so nasty while they were climbing on this particular mountain. And uh, it was, they had to just spend uh, days and nights in, in caves on the mountain until the weather cleared. It's, Actually, uh, where he was was on Mount Suleiman, and Mount Suleiman is probably 30 miles from the Caspian Sea. And so you being an Oregonian and in Portland, you understand this, that um, the, the weather pattern in on the Oregon coast is very much like what uh, happens uh, on uh, in the area with Mount Suleiman being 30 miles from the Caspian Sea. It makes its own weather. Mm-hmm. And so uh, when it finally cleared and they could see, they were seeing the lights of Tehran, their, his guides pointed and said, Aja, Aja. Well, nobody knows what that meant. I didn't know what it meant. And, and yet that was in the book. That must, really must have stuck with, Ed Davis. So just on a hunch, because I had bought this great big pilot's map, oh my goodness, it must be four feet by four feet. It's huge. And I'm thinking, what am I doing with a pilot's map? I can't even read a map. But I knew the quadrants of Mount Suleiman. So I got out my magnifying glass, found those quadrants, and honed in on this dot, Mount Suleiman. And at the foot of this mountain, it couldn't have been five miles, at the foot of the mountain was Aja. I knew where where Ed was. He was never in Turkey. He was never on Mount Ararat. He was on Mount Suleiman. Now, we're starting to seemingly pinpoint this down, but yet physical evidence just still seems to be elusive. <laughs> And I'm going to read something to you, Daniel, that blew my mind a couple months ago. Absolutely, please. And okay. Because, because what I wanted to also get into is that, you know, you don't just approach this from the story point of view, what, and, and just to let the listeners know, some of the stories uh, that you talk about in here uh, where there was actual audio testimony, yes. uh, for lack of a better word, that was presented to yes. you, that you actually took and had verified with people in law enforcement as to whether or not these people were even telling the truth or not, and in a fair amount of cases they weren't. You know, it just didn't make sense or add up. Then you even take it to the next level where you even uh, scientifically approach the physical evidence, like, for instance, well, you know, if this uh, great ship was made of wood, you know, maybe it rotted and has been destroyed by now, but you actually looked into petrification and immediate petrification of the wood which means that this would have turned, or at least a fair amount of it, or some of it, to stone, which means there would be physical evidence. You would be able to find this, and it couldn't really be destroyed. But go ahead, before we get into all that, and read what you came across here just a few months ago. I I did. I was uh, 
I was on the Internet Googling it and trying to find a, a, a Noah's Ark toy for someone. And what I saw on one website just <clears throat> made my mouth drop. This is what it said, Noah's Ark found in Iran. I thought, what? I clicked on that, and you'll never guess what, what picture came up. I couldn't imagine. The cover of my book. <laughs> and my book wasn't even out. I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> Who's scooping me? I, I had, it, it just blew my mind. I think you'll be doing a series like Harry Potter, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> you better get the penning. <laughs> I'm reading this, and this is what it said. It, and this comes out of Iran. It says, Iran, Iranian officials confirmed today that they found Noah's Ark. A team of top Iranian archaeologists discovered the prominent ancient boat at just over 13,000 feet on Mount Suleiman in Iran's Elburz mountain range over the weekend. It is absolutely certainly Noah's Ark, said Tariq Iqbal, president of the Quran Archaeological Search and Exploration Institute based in Tehran. And it says um, the photos uh, that they had taken of this prow-shaped op- outcrop made of petrified wood emerging from a ridge in the mountains. We have had thin sections of the rock and identified the ancient wood cell structures, Iqbal said. Iranian leader, and you're going to like this one, uh-huh. Iranian leader Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said, this proves that Noah's Ark came to its final resting place in Iran and proves that Iranians are God's chosen people. Well, how about that? I, I was stunned. And it almost sounds like what you have read were actually excerpts from your book, as I was just mentioning, the petrifying part. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and then yesterday, uh, a gentleman sent uh, a note to me, an uh, email, and I need to get back with him because I want to know where he found this information. He said, you'll find this interesting because you have talked about the waters being warm or hot uh, in the ocean, and it has something to do with the only only way you could have the amount of ice and snow over the thousands of years was that if there was a a land mass and warm ocean waters. I'm thinking, wow, really? So uh, I have to get back with him and find where that is cited from. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to put that in the book, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know it. Yeah, because that's the other thing I kept thinking myself, too, is did this occur, you know, and it's just a leap, uh, the Triassic period when the land masses were together where you would have had large areas of warm water, for instance. You know, I don't know. Um, But, you know, again, like I said, here like with Ed Davis' story, uh, he was taken to the ark, apparently. Uh, You pretty much located where he was. Yes. Yet, when you go to zero in, where is this thing? I mean, this is an enormous thing here. It just Well, it, it was. Uh, for crying out loud, look, if you can find a fossilized leaf, you <laughs> sure in the heck could find an ark. <laughs> Daniel, it, it's not in one piece anymore. When Ed Davis saw it, it had broken in two. Right. Okay? Now, you have to understand that if the pet... If it did petrify on the outside because the water in certain areas was very hot because of the uh, volcano, volcanic uh, action that was stewing up these poisonous cocktails of gases and so forth, uh, and it was very hot. And when this underwater, uh, oh, it's a small, like a small submarine, I think it was the Japanese that sent that out about seven, eight years ago, and they did that IMAX theater on it, which boggle my mind, these vents that come from the, I don't know, looks like the center of the earth to me, but it was, it looked like a, um, looked like a very large organ, uh, pipe organ pipe, Mm -hmm. and coming straight up, because they had photographs of it. At the top was this soot, like dark soot, and they did take the temperature and said it was 700 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it was that hot in certain places and spewing out acids and sulfur, which these 
uh, underwater volcanoes do, that can start petrification. Mm-hmm. Now, if the pet if was starting to be petrified, then that's the outside of the the ship mm-hmm. because it was pitched. Pitch can be petrified. I found that out, and that's in the book through my um, my granddaughter's uh, professor at college, and she was taking a chemistry class. All I did was write two formulas. I wrote one formula was for tar, pitch, or bitumen. The other one was for petrification. I said to my granddaughter, ask your instructor if the top formula can be turned into the bottom formula. That's all I want to know. And I didn't write anything else on it. I wanted this to be pure coming from her. And sure enough, she said, yes, it can be with some heat. Uh Uh-huh. I don't know how hot. I never did find that out. But with heat, it would destroy the hydrocarbons, and what would be left was petrification. Mm-hmm. So it could petrify on the outside, the tar, but it would not have seeped through to the inside of the ark because if it had petrified on the inside and the outside, it would have sunk like a rock. It, it just wouldn't have happened. It couldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it was if it was going to be uh, petrifying, it had to be in that warm water uh, or in some areas very hot water. But you have to understand, too, with all the fish in the sea, they didn't all die because at first I was kind of mocking this idea, thinking, oh, yeah, right, I can just see all these fish belly up, big and little. But it just couldn't have been that warm or that hot in all the places or the sea life would have never survived it. Hmm. Now, is it possible that perhaps the story of Noah is just a metaphor and that perhaps, perhaps, maybe the ark never got built? Daniel, if I can't believe that story in the Bible, then I can't believe any of God's words. Mm-hmm. I either have to take it by faith and trust what God has said in his word, or I don't want anything to do with any of it. I can't trust any of it. Mm-hmm. But I know that I can take his word all the way to the bank. And and this is in the first five books of the Bible, first one in Genesis. Well, you see, it was Moses who transcribed all that. It was Moses who spent weeks and weeks and weeks on the mountain with God in the Sinai and uh, on Mount Sinai. Mm-hmm. And I would think that if he spent all that time, day and night, he never came down from the mountain. Well, probably six weeks, as God gave him instruction, I think he got it right. And so I can trust that. It might be a metaphor to some people. For me, it is not. It is the way, it's not God's word that is in error. It is man's interpretation of God's word. Well, I certainly experienced that on Mount Adams one night very quickly. (laughs) The interpretation of the evidence you see before you. And there's no doubt that God's word must be solid because it's what saved Ron Wyatt. (laughs) Uh, You can say that again. I was thinking, if you ever run out there like that, do crazy things and lie about it, don't expect me to pray for you. I won't. So... um, So tell us, Mary, are we any closer to finding Noah's Ark, and what efforts are being made, even from a scientific point of view, to go to a lot of these areas that you talk about here in the book? Well, you know, it's not on air at period. Okay, we got that far. You got that straightened out. Mm -hmm. So if you will look at the cover of my book, this was a photograph taken by Bob Cornuke and his men, on Mount Suleiman. And so it's almost uh, in the center of of the book is this dark anomaly. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Mount Suleiman is a granite mountain. You see how much lighter it is in color. Right. Okay. Now, if you look down toward the bottom of the book, you will see white things that look like maybe rocks. Mm Mm-hmm. It isn't, Daniel. Those are sheep, Bob told me. 
Hmm. So that gives you some height and depth of this anomaly that's in the middle of the photograph. Gotcha. Okay? It's not rocks, it's sheep. And it's hard for the listeners to miss what she's talking about because there's a double bolt of lightning that's pretty much <laughs> pointing right at it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. So this, this very <clears throat> picture, this is what the Iranians say is the remains of Noah's Ark. And hmm. Bob and his men took pieces of this anomaly and had it analyzed, and that analysis is in my book. Hmm. And what, what was so amazing for me, I was uh, on a conference call. Bob says, here, call this number and get on the conference call. Listen in to what this scientist who's been going through all of these uh, pieces of this anomaly, and this is what he's come up with. He's going to talk to my men and me. Just listen in. So I... I'm listening and taking notes. And he said something to this effect. He said, this is, what I find. this is what I found in some of these samples. I found the hair of a curly animal. I found grasses. I have found a feather follicle from a bird. And I have found marine life that is only at the bottom of the ocean. It is not. It was not shells. Mm-hmm. He said this was n- this was not brought in. Somebody didn't bring this in. This was in place. He said you don't see these items together in an ecosystem. Mm-hmm. So how did it get there? It's a fascinating story. It's the unsolved mystery of Noah's Ark, and I do know that one thing you do talk about is how there is a lot of money to be made, especially on an unsolved mystery, and they get you all excited about the possibility of what you may uncover as you participate in these programs, only to find out they're not any further along than anybody else was. (laughs) (laughs) And it kind of makes you wonder, again, you know, as compelling as the picture is and the evidence that you present in the book, that you have to then again ask the question, how important would this discovery be when in fact it is uncovered? And that is a wonderful question, uh, Daniel. Uh, For some people, it wouldn't make a a lick of difference. And for me, it wouldn't either, because it's not about an old boat to prove that it did or did not exist. But for, for me... It is that Jesus Christ today is our ark of safety, and he is the only one that can keep us safe. And for others, they're still on an adventure. Some just want to hike. That's great. Uh, Some want to make money. Uh, I'm not so excited about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I were to make money on this book... um, that would amaze me because mm-hmm. I know I've written three other books, and if I were to be an author, I would be in the soup line downtown. <laughs> it's just, you know, un- uh, unless you're uh, in government or writing smut books or whatever, you don't make money. But that mm-hmm. was not my premise for writing the book. My premise for writing the book was this. I had trusted National Geographic and allowed them into my home to film me and my son-in-law, who had been with Jim on Mount Ararat for four hours because what they told me is that they were making a documentary called The Truth Behind the Ark. And I thought, well, it's about time. And I was willing to give them all of my research, photographs, whatever, maps, whatever, anything I had, I was wanting to get the truth out. So I was excited about doing that. And uh, six months later, when this documentary was aired, National Geographic aired the documentary, The Truth Behind the Ark, I could not believe what I was hearing and watching. I just was undone. There was barely a shred of truth that whole hour long. Mm -hmm. And what they had succeeded in doing or tried to do was to make Christians look like they had been weaned on Mesopotamian folklore 
therefore making us look like real buffoons. Mm-hmm. And that undid me so much that uh, I wanted to write a, a, a nasty letter, quite frankly, to the powers that be at National Geographic. And my one of my daughters says, Mom, why don't you just wait, think about it, cool down, I uh, want to write a book. Well, I didn't want to write a book, but she said, pray about it. Now, isn't that like your kids that tell you to pray about something? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I will. I will pray about it, and I'll go from there. Mm-hmm. And after about a month of praying about it, I realized that this was something I needed to do. Mm-hmm. I needed to tell the truth. Whatever the truth was, let the tips fall where they may. And so that is why the book is in print. I believe the most challenging part of something as awesome as this particular mystery or, you know, uh, artifact is, is that there are people perhaps like yourself who get out there and authentically and genuinely pursue what the truth actually is uh, with the earnest uh, outcome of allowing people to see for themselves what the reality of this truth is. And that, as you said as well, and you say this in your book, and it's very disturbing to know that that's just how we humans can be. There are charlatans out there trying to take advantage of a situation such as a Ron Wyatt. Yeah. And, you know, take away that shroud of mystery. I'm remembering, even though as bad as the movie was, the 1978 version of King Kong. And Jeff Bridges, you know, was just telling these guys, you can't take this animal off this island. You just can't do this. And he says, you know, because in a few months you're going to have nothing but a bunch of burned-out drunks. You're taking away their mystery. You know, this is what they are. And, you know, Noah's Ark, regardless of if people are out there trying to disprove this thing exists, or it's been proven that it doesn't. Whatever it is, it still allows the myth and the mystery of who we are to know that something, for instance, like the size, the sheer size and the task of Noah's Ark to actually come into existence, metaphor or not, is the reality of the power we are as co-creators to be able to continue on this mystery to explore who we are. Well, you know, Daniel, I also knew that there, uh, that Iran is on a fault line, and they have many earthquakes. Very, very disturbing to know how many thousands of people get killed in those. Sure. So I did um, contact in Golden, Colorado. I contacted the people that uh, monitor all of the uh, seismic earthquakes all around the world, mm-hmm. and I asked them about, did you have any... Uh, documentation in this part of the world, in Iran, of any six or seven point uh, uh, earthquakes. They said, no, but we've had a lot of four and five. Hmm. Well, that is enough to start jarring things on the side of a mountain to undermine it, to get it to crack. Does that make sense to you? Yes. And so between that and when it really, really warms up and gets very hot, and those Sirocco winds come down uh, from the uh, 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 the desert type of uh, area, it it is so hot that it melts those glaciers very quickly. So the water flowing down uh, underneath the arc and then being uh, probably moved with some of those earthquakes, I can see how it undermined and finally cracked in two. And once it was cracked in two, then the inside began to deteriorate quite rapidly because oh, sure. it was not petrified. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It totally does. Okay. Mm-hmm. I just, uh, for some reason, there's an, uh, a term in India that pops into my mind called Lila, and that is the idea that God likes to play hide-and-go-seek. <laughs> and this certainly seems to be one of those things. I do exist but you're going to have to look for me. (laughs) Sometimes I think that's probably not too far off. So, Mary, tell me, how much uh, are you going to continue to pursue this till the end of the days? Or, or, you know, how does the continuation of the research of Noah's Ark? I don't think I have anything else to research because as, uh, as I prayed about it, I said before it was ever published, I said, okay, God, are there any other stories you want me to take on? Because... 
this was this was at at, at his uh, guiding and directing, and and I I was willing to do more. If that's what he wanted, but that's not what he wanted. Mm-hmm. So when he shut the door, I said, "Okay, I've shut the door." And as far as I'm concerned, I have the answer in my heart, and I can't help what other people think or don't think. Uh, I'm not going to put my neck out there any more than Bob Cornuke is and say, yeah, that's the remains of Noah's Ark. But you know what? The president of Iran already did that for me. I know uh, with the brief amount of time we have left, there was one I was interested in pursuing that you talk about here in the book, uh, Carola Kotz. Uh-huh. And the reason is, is because you describe this uh, person who has produced uh, apparently uh, something of 300 pages or better Correct. and tends to <clears throat> uh, not just simply from a scientific point of view pursue this, but almost from a mystical side as well. And that just seemed very interesting to me. Well, I was very selective in what I took out of her manuscript with the per- mm-hmm. her son's permission. <clears throat> because uh, some of it did sound mystical to me. Mm-hmm. And I was just too overwhelmed after reading 350 pages. I, I think, oh, my goodness gracious, I can't put I can't put this in my, my book, but I was very selective mm-hmm. because I know that the woman did have visions. She did see some things. And what the visions she had absolutely matched what she had already seen physically which when she was uh, stationed in Iran working and uh, her her flight from Baghdad into uh, Iran, and she saw that uh, 20 years later in a vision and didn't know what it was, and she had to sort it out. But she feels that, uh, that Noah's Ark, well, she wrote a letter to my husband and said, don't risk your life going to Ararat where... Noah's Ark never landed, mm. and so that when I saw that letter, it, it almost pulled me right out of my skin. I thought, "Oh my goodness, you mean somebody is on the same page with me?" And so uh, this all began to unravel uh, until I contacted uh, Carola's kids. Um, she had passed away, and uh, the son had all her her research boxes of books. I think she had done this for over twenty years herself. Mm-hmm. But she'd gone, she'd gone at it from a different point of view than I had, and so I wanted to be able to pull in some of the things that she had seen or that she uh, had uh, researched and had validated. So I, I found it was interesting. Well, what we do know is that Easter is around the corner, so for all of us we can find something that's a little easier to search for, and that's Easter eggs. That's right. Forget about Noah's Ark. It's not on Mount Ararat. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, we want to thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. Is there a website people can find out more about this from you? Uh, yes, actually, I do have a website. Okay. Uh, it's the title of the book, but leave the word the off. Okay, Unsolved Mysteries of uh, Noah's Ark dot com. Uh huh. That's correct. Unsolved okay. Mystery of Noah's Ark dot com. Really enjoyed reading this, and, you know, just uh, what an era of, of, of enjoyable mystery this all is, and it's uh, very compelling, and, you know, it's kind of like the Edmund Fitzgerald, you know, just will it ever be found? <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you, Daniel. We want to thank you, the listeners out there. We put a little bit of mystery into your life, and one of them is Search for Us, beyond 50 radioblogspot Dot com. That is the number 50. We do have a free weekly e-news update. You can find out more about that. And also the unsolved mystery of Noah's Ark as well. Our guest today, Mary Irwin. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Daniel Davis. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>